Thank you so much, Mary, and thank you, Exploratorium, for having me here tonight, and thank you for all of you for coming. Uh, so yeah, I want to acknowledge my co-authors on this research, uh, Sue Listen, who, if you've been doing the herbarium pressing, um, she is leading that today. Uh, Celia Smith and Kyle Van Houten, uh, and this is work done at the aquarium. So I'm going to be using the term algae, macroalgae, and seaweed kind of interchangeably. Uh, seaweed are macroalgae, macroalgae are seaweed. It means algae that you can see with your eyes, so not plankton, um, but uh, the seaweed that you press, the seaweed that you see washed up on shore. Uh, so why did we want to set out and do this study? We need observations to make predictions about our future. So in this ex example from the IPCC, uh, Arctic sea ice is decreasing. And so they made two uh, scenarios, two projections on the right-hand side of the figure, the blue and the red of different scenarios um, in the future. And all of that is based on the purple section, which it goes from 1980 to present day. And th that's all of our observations. Uh, before that, we didn't have satellite images to document the sea ice coverage. And so the historical uh, data had to be modeled as well. So really, the only data we know for sure um, is the purple section. And that's because instrumentation only began in the latter half of the 20th century. Uh, and so if we want to be able to make projections about our future, we need data about our past. Um, so that we can have greater certainty about uh, what we can expect in our environment. And though we don't have instruments that were recording temperature uh, satellites uh, before the mid 20th century, we do have the option of these living tissues storing information about the environment going much further back. So this is a cross section of a cypress tree from Virginia. Um, and each uh, ring of the tree is uh, proportionate in size to the rainfall that uh, it got that year, that it experienced that year. And so we can match up with known events experienced by the colonists in that area um, of, of droughts um, and heavy rain events. Uh, and so the tree is recording this environmental data. Similarly, we can construct these paleo uh, food webs. So using stable isotopes, we can figure out what animals were eating each other and create an entire web just by the tissues of these preserved specimens. So we're able to uh, group these into herbivores, omnivores, um, faunivores, aquatic and terrestrial. And that's the idea behind the Monterey Bay Aquarium's Ocean Memory Lab, uh, that we want to on unlock data that's stored in the tissues of organisms themselves, um, that they are recording, they have memory of the ocean in its past um, and present state. And in the lab, we have uh, a variety of specimens. Um, in the upper left, that's a whale bulla, which is the inner ear, ear bone. Uh, and it is uh, like the tree where it's laying down layers year after year. So this is one single animal that throughout its lifespan, lifespan is recording uh, information about its environment. Uh, and so that's one approach we can take. Another approach we take is using multiple organisms, multiple animals or algae um, to stitch together these different snapshots, these points in time. So one study that was done out of our lab used seabird feathers, um, those are feathers in the bottom left, uh, to figure out what seabirds were eating and actually construct uh, what the trophic food web was of the ocean over a series of 100 years by taking a single feather from each bird in, um, in a museum at Bishop Museum in Hawaii. Um, and being able to construct that using stable isotopes. And that's what we're doing with seaweed here. We're using separate individuals to stitch together um, this history of the past. And this started because the aquarium had some seaweed in a herbarium, so pressed and preserved seaweeds. Um, and so did the Hopkins Marine Station, which is Stanford's field station that's right next door to the aquarium. And the aquarium's been around since 1984, but Hopkins uh, Marine Station has been there since 1892, and people were collecting. Um, and so that's where we got this idea uh, to 
at, to use these um, specimens to look at the ocean in the past in our southern Monterey Bay location. And this can be applied many places because there's herbaria across the world. In Europe, um, there's herbaria from the 1700s. Um, most are collected in the 1800s um, because it was a, a really big trend uh, in Victorian um, <laughs> Great Britain. So this is a cartoonist, and this I think he's making fun of those that are <laughs> going out uh, tide pooling and seaweed hunting um, in, that s in that same era in the latter uh, 19th century. Um, and it was popular because natural history was being explored by Victorians in an academic setting, um, but also in a popular setting. So this is, these are people that are of the leisure class that are able to escape the industrial cities um, and go to the coast and pursue this as a hobby. Um, and it was one that women could do. Uh, this is uh, Margaret Gaddy, who once said, you know, you can bring men along. A low water mark expedition is more comfortably undertaken under the protection of a gentleman. He may fossilize or sketch, or even if he will be savage and barbaric, shoot gulls while you get your work done. Um, she, she also outlined how women can participate still wearing their corsets and their large skirts. Um, and so still fitting in, in with their comfortable gender norm. Uh, but be able to participate in natural history expedition because uh, natural history, as far as um, mammalian collecting goes, mammals, uh, other vertebrates, reptiles, birds, was all hunting. And so that wasn't considered very ladylike at the time. Um, but pressing seaweeds, plants, that was acceptable. And if you go back to, if we go back to the, um, the cartoon, most of those image, th most of those characters there that are drawn are very full skirts. So this was definitely a pursuit that uh, many women uh, were able to follow. Um, but it wasn't just a hobby. Um, this is Margaret Gaddy's uh, British Seaweeds uh, Herbarium collection, and she wrote the book for that time period on British seaweeds. Um, at the Pacific Grove Natural History Museum, which is right next to the aquarium, there are some that are uh, more hobbyist collections uh, that women did. So here, this is titled Flowers of the Sea, uh, which is a, a beautiful term for something that many people don't appreciate <laughs> in the same way that people appreciate flowers. Uh, and so these are nearly like scrapbooks. So that's a beautiful microcladia that's spread out, um, almost lace-like, uh, and uh, images about where images and writing about where it is was found. Um, and this is an example that I think is pretty cool. This is bound in whale vertebra as the, the book binding to create this beautiful um, collection. And so we were able to use our own herbarium, the Monterey Bay Aquariums, which goes from 1984 to present. And then the Stanford University's Hopkins Marine Station, which went from 1892 to 1980, so they were very complementary. But we did have some time gaps. And so I went on macroalgae.org, which uh, brings together herbaria from across the nation, really. Um, and this is an example of the digitized collection. There's a color plate in the bottom left. There's a ruler up in the top um, so that there's this sort of standardized uh, way that um, these different herbaria are uploading their um, specimens along with the collector, the location, and the date so that others can find this and figure out where these um, species are, these specimens are located and be able to collaborate. So I contacted herbarium uh, from UC Berkeley's university herbarium that had some specimens uh, that we needed to fill in the early uh, 1900s as a gap. Uh, the San Diego Natural History Museum, uh, University of North Carolina, and University of Michigan um, to sort of fill out our time series. Um, and some of these specimens are really quite beautiful. Um, these were all collected by uh, Mrs. Swanton. And uh, around this time period, Fred Swanton was the mayor of Santa Cruz. Um, and it was known as the father of the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. He helped get that started. And so Mrs. Swanton is either his 
his wife um, or his mother, his parents lived in Pescadero, which is where um, several of these are collected from. Um, and I couldn't find out much more information other than that. So in many cases, uh, the women are kind of erased from this, um, this more academic format of collecting. Um, but one name that I kept finding was uh, Bradley M. Davis when I was looking through these. And so he had pressed specimens in 1892 and then again in 1922. And that was kind of curious, these two years, 30 years apart, um, what was his story? So I had to look him up. Um, and in 1892, he was an undergrad at Stanford. And so that was the first year that the um, Marine Research Station was located there. He was part of Stanford's inaugural graduating class. Um, and then he later became a professor in botany um, and was at a couple universities before he was at University of Michigan. So he must have gone back uh, as a professor to collect uh, and relive the glory days of his youth, um, though I'm purely speculating there. But he um, was really well documented. I could find lots of information about him. He was the former president of the American Society of Naturalists, um, and he's the reason why um, some of the seaweed specimens that I was after were housed at University of Michigan, where he became uh, a professor. And so it was fun piecing that together. Um, another person who was involved in uh, our collection is Professor Isabella Abbott, who also known as Izzy. Um, and Professor Izzy Abbott was at Stanford Hopkins Marine Station um, in the 60s and 70s. Um, she's the first uh, native Hawaiian to get a PhD in the sciences, and she was the first woman uh, professor there um, at Stanford. And so she was really a trailblazer. And she also, uh, w this study wouldn't have been possible without her. She collected very thoroughly um, throughout the 60s and 70s, and the, those specimens are really the backbone of our study. Um, and she did that because she was writing the book on Pacific seaweeds. Um, and she, her book is still what, what uh, is one of the gold standards that we use today. So given all of this history, what were our objectives for our study? Uh, we wanted to demonstrate a new value for these underused herbaria. Sometimes these collections are just sort of stored um, in shelves and nobody's really paying attention to them. Um, and that was the case in um, a couple of our collections. Uh, we wanted to generate these ecosystem records before instrument measurements uh, were possible. So we wanted to extend these, this uh, time series of data back before the mid um, 20th century. And we wanted to establish repeatable methods so that others could use this, um, this method and answer questions that are relevant to their own systems. And we hoped that this might encourage other institutions to uh, change their operating procedures. Um, a lot of collecting has been underfunded, so these collections exist, but they're just kind of these relics, and no one is still uh, collecting today. Um, and this is a method for documenting global change, so we hope that um, others will be encouraged to do this. So our study had two parts, uh, two phases. The phase one was an experiment. So we wanted to use these historical 100-year-old specimens that were um, pressed on this old paper. But first, we needed to know, were these specimens uh, actually documenting the ocean at that time? Or was there some effect of pressing that caused them to decay in their microchemistry? Or was there also um, anything in the paper itself, like heavy metals in the manufacturing, that would cause uh, the seaweed to, uh, to be any different than how it normally or would fresh out of the ocean. And once we knew that we uh, would be able to use the seaweed um, to document the uh, ocean at the time, that there wasn't any effect on the microchemistry from this long drying process um, and preserving process, then we would be able to do this case study, this phase two, where we use the historical specimens to reconstruct environmental features prior to instrument records. So first we went out and we collected a bunch of seaweed. Uh, we wanted to get a diverse group of seaweed, so we wanted greens, 
We wanted browns and we wanted reds. Uh, we wanted some that were bladed, so wide blades, and some that had narrow branching, um, just in case there was any difference in how these uh, seaweeds were affected. And we picked six species um, that fit all of those categories, and in our database, they were well represented across um, years, so that we'd be able to use them um, to look at this historical record. And so when we use this bladed red as cryptopleura, this one was on the buoy um, that some of you pressed uh, earlier today. Uh, this is a branching red. It's kind of a lacy, um, bushy <laughs> seaweed called gelidium is the genus name. This is a pin cushion seaweed, Cladophora. It looks like moss growing on rocks. This is Olva cal californica. All the Olva species are called sea lettuce, and this is a really common one that people eat. Um, and this was also a different species, but uh, same genus. This was found on the buoy today. Um, it's a really thin green, beautiful bright color. Uh, we use Silvicia. This is a brown branching seaweed. It's a rockweed. Uh, this is what you'll see um, at the high tide line on the rocks. And we use macrocystis, which is this uh, giant kelp. It's the iconic kelp for the southern and central California coasts. Uh, and this is what uh, sea otters rely on for their habitat. So we rinsed off all our seaweed. We pressed it. That's Sue Listen on the left, who's leading the um, pressing today. Um, and we pressed them on two different types of paper, modern paper and historical paper, to see if there was any difference in the paper manufacturing that could affect them. And we also took a uh, sample of each species and just oven dried it first to see if we uh, tested those immediately, would they be the same as those that were pressed so that we could understand the effect of pressing. Then we processed them in the Ocean Memory Lab we took off sections over a period of a year. So every couple months, we took off a new section. We ground it with a mortar and pestle into this homogenous powder and sent them into to three different labs for amino acid analysis, heavy metal analysis, and stable isotope analysis. So we wanted to cover all these different uh, microchemistry characteristics um, for this part of the study. And then we looked at our results. You don't need to know anything other than these are flat lines. So over the course of a year, nothing really changed um, for each of the amino acids. Um, and that goes for on the archived, the old paper, which is the top section, and the modern paper on the bottom. So we didn't see any effect of either time affecting these seaweed pressings or the paper itself. For heavy metals, we saw some variability, um, but the start and end points were the same. Um, and so we th think that the, the variability is due to uh, different parts of the seaweed storing the metals differently. So uh, in kelps, they store a lot of arsenic in the blades, but less so in the stipes, for example, would be a, a reason for why we would see that variability. Um, and then for stable isotopes, these were also pretty unchanging over the time period and did not differ between the old paper on the left and the new modern paper on the right. Um, we saw some change for the oxygen, which is the blue at the bottom, um, but it wasn't statistically significant. So to sum up those results, did the historical paper alter the microchemistry of the pressed macroalgae? No, so we can interpret these historical specimens uh, without having to calibrate, um, which we would uh, have to do otherwise. And did the pressed seaweed values change over one year? Did the pressing and the drying process alter their microchemistry? No, but some species were more variable for certain metrics, like for some of those heavy metals um, for some of the species. So we use these results to then pick one um, group of seaweed to use as our, our environmental proxy, to use as the uh, ocean memory recorder. And we chose gelidium, so that was the branching red species. Um, and that's what we used in this next uh, part of the study. And we wanted to look at stable isotope analyses. And so we chose gelidium in part because it performed really well. It was really consistent. Um, but it also is a branching seaweed. Um, 
And so we could remove small portions of it without it affecting the overall look of the pressing. And so we thought that uh, the herbaria um, institutions would be more willing to give us a little part if it didn't affect the overall look. Um, and we used nitrogen because it required a very small sample. Um, and we didn't want to affect these uh, priceless specimens. Um, and so we went back into the collection and pulled out um, all the gelidium that we could. And we compared the values to a few different environmental um, data sets that we had available for our location um, for that time period. Um, and the most interesting one we found was for the, the Bacon's, Bacon's Upwelling Index, which went from 1946 to present. Um, and so that was a measure of upwelling, and it correlated strongly with the nitrogen stable isotope values. So in years that there was high upwelling, high volumes of upwelling, <laughs> or high uh, upwelling index values, we saw really high stable nitrogen isotope values. And so that made sense. And why did it make sense? Uh, stable nitrogen isotopes um, increase when the growth rate increases. So when the algae is growing really fast, it has really high nitrogen isotope values. And it makes sense to us that the algae is growing really fast in years that there was really high upwelling. Um, if we talk about uh, upwelling a little bit, uh, so upwelling is caused by surface winds as they um, interact with the coastal shore, and it moves the water body that's near the coast, and that causes the deeper, colder, nutrient-rich water to come up from the deep and replace that water. And it's really the uh, productivity regime for the Monterey Bay. This is what brings in nutrients that cause causes the plankton and the macroalgae to grow really fast. And then they, in turn, feed all of the animals all the way up the food chain um, in our area. And it's the reason why people come to the Monterey Bay to go whale watching. It's just a very productive area, often called the Blue Serengeti. And it's because of upwelling. So we looked at, on the right-hand side of the figure, we have upwelling data. And then we hindcast, so we estimated what the upwelling would be for the um, first half of our time series based on the seaweed. So we took the relationship between the stable nitrogen isotopes and upwelling, um, and each of those little points on the left is one seaweed specimen. And we were able to get this estimate of what upwelling um, would look like throughout that time period. And we noticed this big dip in the middle of uh, the 20th century in the 1940s into 1950. And so we were interested in what was also going on in that time period. And the Monterey Bay sardine fishery was having its boom in the 1940s, followed by a crash in the 1950s. And we originally, it was originally thought um, that that was due to overfishing, and it definitely was uh, a contributing factor. But researchers at uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, led by um, Francisco Chavez, found that it wasn't just overfishing. It was these entire regime shifts, uh, these entire uh, ocean shifts um, between these forage fish. So some decades, sardines were the number one forage fish that everyone could get. And other decades, it was the anchovy regime. Um, and it alternated between these two regimes. And it was largely based on temperature. So warm years, uh, warm decades, sardines would rain, and cooler decades, uh, anchovies would rain. And this was happening right at that time point uh, when we experienced the sardine uh, boom and then crash, is there was a switch from the sardine to the anchovy regime. Uh, and the decrease that we see in upwelling correlates with this peak in sardine catch followed by the shift to the anchovy range. And that's largely because weak upwelling produces small prey that sardines actually specialize in slightly offshore, while strong up upwelling produces large prey that anchovies specialize on. And when we look at the entire theory of that the that researchers found for these different ocean-wide um, 
shifts this under the sardine regime, we would expect there to be weaker upwelling. And our seaweed were actually recording that before we had instruments to know that that is the case for sure. So in summary for this second phase, the seaweed were re revealing this historical upwelling pattern before we had instruments available to document. And these processes may have contributed to this sardine anchovy regime shift. So we had overfishing. We also had these ocean basin wide temperature oscillations. But we also had local upwelling processes that the seaweed recorded. Uh, so in conclusion, um, this method can be used by others to answer questions that are relevant um, in their location around the world, um, wherever there are herbaria that have these collections of historical algae. Um, they're underfunded and underutilized, and we hope that they're used in more conservation-minded research. Um, there are a lot of genetic studies uh, done with herbaria. There are studies that do look at distribution um, from where species were collected over time. But there are very few that have used the tissue of the algae themselves um, to answer conservation questions. Uh, and so we feel like continued collecting is necessary to provide long-term records to allow um, researchers of the future to ask questions we can't even imagine today. So Mrs. Swanton um, and Bradley M. Davis probably had no idea that the specimens that they were collecting would be used for a study like this. Izzy Abbott probably would have some sort of idea, but we can't even picture what people might be able to ask in the future if we don't collect those, um, continue collecting those specimens now um, and reveal these ocean processes that maybe instruments can't even reveal today. Uh, and so just wanted to say that this was funded by the Monterey Bay Aquarium and thank all of the people that were involved in this study uh, from collecting specimens, preparing them, and then also the several uh, herbaria that donated their specimens for us to use. They put a lot of trust in us. Um, and those curators of those herbaria are definitely interested in asking more of these questions. It's really funding is the issue.